we have a really unique program that we teach in. Uh, popular music programs don't really exist too much in academia, especially no. in the US. So how did our program come to be? Was it based on another model from somewhere else? And like, was it a hard sell to the university? Uh, well, yeah, so um, because it was uh, a lot of it was before my time. So there's only you know, there's only so much detail that I, I know of about the origins. But essentially, there was a guy called Gary Tamblin who founded the got the popular music program at the Gold Coast. Um, and what's amazing, like looking, looking back now with with the situation room now. So Gary managed to um, the whole idea with the pop program. Again, this is alongside Don Lebler, who um, a lot of his research is on collaborative learning and peer learning, peer feedback. So the whole design of this Gold Coast program was um, students learn off each other as much as they learn off the staff. Uh, everything or as much as possible is collaborative. You know, so group work, collaborative stuff. Um, the students are assessing each other and providing uh, peer feedback for each other at the end of every trimester for their major study. And that was the, the kind of the spine through the entire Bachelor of Popular Music. And on top of that, I don't know how Gary did this, but he got approval for a custom built facility at the Gold Coast, which, you know, you've taught in. Hmm. It's amazing. Like, you know, yes. there's one, two, yes. three, four studio recording studios, one of which could fit a small orchestra and no problem. It's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a bunch of post-production rooms, a bunch of teaching rooms. All of it was just for us. We didn't have to share those spaces with anyone else, which now is almost unheard of. <laughs> I know. You know so the fact that he got approval for that and and also credit to Griffith University for whoever signed off on that. I don't I wasn't around and so I don't know, but whoever signed off on that, there's a lot of faith and trust they put in Gary to build that up. Um so uh Donna came on along with Gary and a bunch of other teaching staff there, and Brendan as well. Um and so Gary um kind of built that up into its own, you know, fully fledged bachelor. Um and it, we went from taking I think in the early days they took less than 20 students per year and it eventually got up to about 55 students um, coming in every first year, which was actually too many, to be honest. Yes. Um, but it was yes. just because the program was so profitable, um, the uni just kept um, increasing the numbers mm. coming in because there was no shortage of people that wanted to do it. Yes. Um, so now at South Bank, obviously our numbers are, are back down kind of in between that and I think way more sustainable, at least for the kind of program that we run. Uh, and for the resources that we have and and um it, it allows me to do what i want to do which is actually in, have impact on pretty much every student in our cohort so we don't have so many students like um other schools which I, my, again my hat's off to them if i've got you know a griffith business might have 800 first years come in or more you can't get to know 800 students um but mm. that's the nature of those courses but mm. the arts what a privilege that we get to actually know our students and have a direct hand in and helping them shape who they want mm. to be. That's yeah. so well beyond just the course content. You know, it's absolutely, yeah. absolutely about who they are. Exactly. Because student centered learning is so important in what we do. And so how many are there in the program at the moment? Uh, you know, there's always a little, um, a couple of students that drop off over the years, but generally our attention's high. So we're probably looking at, um, it'd be, uh, 60, just 60. Up, maybe just under. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's across over all three, three years. years. Yes. And okay. I know this year the enrollment, the, or the application numbers were significantly high. Yeah. So. Can you tell me how many we had and how many um, were actually well, we're, we're, offered? We're still getting people wanting to apply, so that just keeps going. So, but the people that we audition, I think we had two hundred and thirty, and we only take twenty um, wow. students. And that's been even. I mean, this year was a little, little higher than previous, but generally there's always a couple of hundred. Mm. Um, so we only we only take ten percent of the of the students that apply. So it means the we absolutely get the cream of the crop. Um, and the cohorts are very strong because of that. They are. 
they are yeah. very strong but it's because i mean it's because we're offering what students want i know that yeah. in the us at present uh, enrollments into music programs have dropped by 33 percent so wow. And that's because they're not offering what students want and what they need. They're still stuck within that Western Eurocentric teaching model. Yeah. Why do you think that other institutions are so insistent on, on keeping those traditions going through their education programs? Um, What's your I mean, theory? I'm, this is just my 20 cents and I'm, you know, I'm no expert on international education. I'm, I'm well aware of what's happening in other places, but you know, I'm, I'm just before I say anything, I'm not going to put my name forward as someone who's the, you know, the, the be all and end all of this stuff. No. But I do, I do no. have some thoughts, and um, I think the first, the first one for me is that I think there's actually a lot of fear in in opening up program designs to a level where you give the students the amount of ownership that we do. Because if you're historically not used to that, it seems absolutely chaotic. Um, so uh -huh. universities are essentially administrative corporations and funded administrative corporations and structure and policy has become, uh, it's bloated, but it is necessary when you've got corporate governance and you know, uh, accountability like that. You do need all those things and they're important. And I'm thankful that we have all those policies um but like the second it's almost like some of the tertiary institutions are going more towards the the kind of lockdown nature of secondary school which secondary school is actually not working it's not working the way it's supposed to work it's it's actually quite broken across the board not because of the teachers the teachers actually don't get to teach as in in terms of what when I, when I say teach i mean in the spirit of teaching which is I want to mold and have impact on the lives of the students that are in front of me and every student's different. And sure, we've got a, a collective thing that we need to cover this term in class, but you know, I'm going to adjust my language of a few different ways for different mm -hmm. students to help their learning mm -hmm. approaches yeah. and their learning yes. personalities. Yes. They can't do that now because they're so jammed to the walls with all this um, administrative and bureaucratic, um, you know, kind of structure. And they're sort of, they're sort of hogtied a bit. Um, and can't really get out of that. And I, university, yes, there's funding requirements from the federal government. Like in Australia, we have TEXA and we have to, you know, we're going through a full program review at the moment to make sure that we're aligned um, and continue to stay aligned with all their goals and values and requirements. But university also has an amazing amount of freedom in terms of the course convener designs the curriculum, the program um, director um, helps to moderate and, you know, collate all those design ideas and make sure they serve an overarching, you know, goal. And then the university executive basically makes sure that lines up with the federal requirements for funding. So, but ne I've never had, thankfully, because Donna has, has been an amazing boss, I've never had her say, here's the restrictions, here's the requirements, um, what kind of course you want to build with those requirements. She just says, mm. do something that's powerful for the students and, and make sure they're, they're um, you know, exploring and, and, touching these particular things and that when they, you know, they meet these graduate outcomes basically. So I design my course and then I, you know, in the early days I'd have to go and sit with her and go through the nuts and bolts of the administrative mm -hmm. stuff. But now because I understand all that, I can absolutely work within the system to give everything that the government needs, everything the university needs to them, but create really inspiring experiences for the students where they're truly learning and engaging and stepping into more holistic development of who they are, but it takes a certain um, commitment to a controlled, that's kind of controlled chaos, um, but that's only how it seems on the surface. <laughs> it's actually very um, repeatable um, year on year. Like as you know, you know you've been working, um, doing the vocal stuff for me for years now. And yes, every cohort can be different, but the outcomes are, are generally yeah. repeatable because yes even though they've got some controlled chaos in there, it's controlled and repeatable and safe and secure in terms of the learning environment. Um, and pedagogically, I just make sure that we line up with anything that evolves with the university. And that's, that's what they pay me to do. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do it. So it's interesting. Some of the other peers that I talk to, um, there's a few, few 
that I absolutely think get it and they're doing their thing, but a lot of them are scared of, you know, uh, like in their mind, it's like you're just, um, you're, you're knocking over the whole dam and you're going to flood the whole village, you know, the university village. It's just going to flood. Everything's going to flood. It's going to be <laughs> terrible. Um, but the, the truth is um, if students don't have agency or they don't have ownership, at least um, enough ownership, over their learning journeys, they're going to stop coming or they're going to drop out or they're not going to be interested in those programs. The kids that exactly. come and do arts degrees don't want to go do traditional pathways. So why frame them like a traditional pathway? Because they're not. The industry doesn't work like that. It's mm. massively uninspiring and not mm. helpful for the students. Yeah. Now, does that mean it's easy? No. Um, but is it worthwhile not only for the students and the staff, but also for the university's bottom line? I think so. Mm. Mm. I Absolutely. think there's a, there's a way to deal with all those things. It just takes, again, a bit of bravery and a bit of, um, a bit of spine to give stuff a go. And if you're smart, you can do it in a way where it, it doesn't cripple any part of your school or your, your element or your university. You kind of, the way I've done it with the songwriting and the performance courses is controlled experimentation over years. You know, okay, this this is working. I'm going to lock that down for this next year. But this bit, I'm going to try this brave new thing. I'm just going to try this crazy idea and see if it works. Okay, that, you know, 80% of it worked. That 20%, that's it. I'm not doing that again. That's a bad way of doing it. Let's revisit or, you know, but then the next time that 80% gets locked down. So that becomes, you know, 50% yes. of the next course is locked down. And I could be braver with 50% because I know more what I'm doing with that course. I know, I know what the, the costs are. I know how to respond academically or administratively. Um, yeah. So that's, it's kind of like you just do, you take calculated steady risks to create an environment where the students just are excited to be there and want to be there. So in terms of course content and what may be the point of difference between our program and other programs out there, what are some of the things that we offer? I think the, um, again, this is where we get back to the self-directed nature of a lot of what we do. Um, one of the things that has changed with, with students in general is, you know, back in the day when we all went through high school, there was no way to check the information that you're being taught other than if your family happened to own an encyclopedia set, which I remember the day my dad, you know, bought the, the guy would come to the door, remember, be like, oh, I yes, think we had, um, yes, what yes. was ours, world, world Book Encyclopedia? World Book and Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Britannica was the, well, the one I, I thought like the rich people had for some reason, but. Yes, same. So we had, we had world book and, you know, sometimes I would go in there and read about some of the stuff that we're doing at school, but that was the only way. Now all our students can jump online and hear 10 different contrasting opinions about the thing we talked about that day in a lecture, some of which are really, you know, are misinformed and some of them, which are really great, but just a different viewpoint. They've got all this different stuff in front of them. So if you're building your program or your ideas around, you know, for your course design and content around come and I will be the purveyor of, you know, of knowledge and experience and expertise. I, the first thing I say to my first years coming in is I'm going to share as much as I can with you, but you would be foolish not to have a look out there and see what else is around and learn as much as possible. If any of it feels weird or you want to talk about it, bring it to class. We'll talk about it together. Mm -hmm. But okay. I do have a lot of lived experience. I've, I've, I've also done all the research and those things that you're about to start exploring online. And I'm more than happy to talk about any of it. I've basically had to curate the things I think are the most impactful for you in my class. So that's what we're going to do. But if you want to take tangents at any time, again, control chaos, you know, I always build mm -hmm. about 20% mm -hmm. tangent time into my lectures and my tutorials. If you want to go on a tangent and we can swing 10 minutes to do that, you know, five minutes or whatever is needed, absolutely let's do it you know so and that once they realize that's actually okay and not only just okay but encouraged they get really excited because they're like oh that's the thing i want to talk about and, and that what you just said maybe remember this youtube video that i saw this you know i used to i heard this guy say this thing once is that true or you know mm -hmm. um so it's more like um so because the students have access to so much information that what i'm finding the most powerful for an arts degree it's not necessarily achievable when you've got you know, 800 kids or whatever in a lecture, but you know, maybe there's ways to do that as well. But for us, um, 
say, just take songwriting as, as an example. So they have a 50 minute lecture with me. I generally show some examples, which isn't anything revolutionary. And I get into some really chunky stuff. I always share some personal examples and including the failures, like wins and fails from my own career um, to do with that particular technique or approach or, you know, concept. And then they go have a coffee and immediately after that, they have a tutorial where the tutorial activities are a practical exploration of what we just talked about in the lecture. But only the first kind of three weeks of first year are prescriptive and that's on purpose just to, to test personalities and to see who's who in the cohort and help me customize my class for them. Yes. Um, but then beyond that, they basically have way increasingly own, um, increased ownership and um, self-directed um, decision-making permission, basically. Um, but every single week, they're physically, practically, creatively exploring what we just talked about so that the thing that they're learning isn't just me saying blah, blah, blah. The thing is they hear someone suggest this idea, maybe play some examples, then they get to explore it and then they show that to each other as a group every week, including the failures. And we That's celebrate amazing. the failures as much as we celebrate the wins. So everyone, if someone tries big and fails big, they actually get a bigger clap than people that just do something that's good yeah, that they kind of yeah. already knew how to do. Um, and that culture gets built in really, really soon. So rather than it being about um, how much content can I squeeze into this class, it's what's the most important content at this particular stage in their journey and how much free space can I leave for them to actually explore it and, and ingest it and deeply understand it or, you know, understand it to whatever level is expected at first or second and third year. That space um, is where a lot of teachers get nervous because they feel like it's either laziness or it's inefficient or it's, um, you know, the students won't do anything. They'll just sit on their butts. I can tell you, at least in a creative sense and, and within you know, arts kind of degrees, if students have freedom to explore something that you've just excited them about, they love it. They absolutely yes. love it. And then the next week they want to come because they're like, oh, every single week they feel like they're being empowered and that they're learning something just every single week. And that, that becomes addictive for them. Just like, you know, I know you're a lifelong learner too. And so am I, and that addiction that's in me, I want to instill in as many of my kids as possible. I'm saying kids, but you know, young adults. I, I call my them and... my babies. Yeah, you know I, call that. I, always, <laughs> I, I call them my babies, especially yeah. my first years. I call them my first year babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, I mean, because essentially they are basically the age of my kids anyway. Um, but yeah, they're, they're young adults, absolutely. But I love, I love the idea of not just telling them to be self-directed, but actually mentoring mm. and, and supervising and supporting them, particularly in that first year with a structure that lets them explore it safely. And if they need anything, I'm there. I'm, mm. I'm wandering around all the different songwriting rooms. I'm sticking my head in constantly. I'm like, hey, how you going? Well, that sounds cool. Hey, don't forget to include such and such in the corner just because they're a quiet personality doesn't mean that, you know, all that's that kind of um, grassroots stuff is just as important as the content I just talked about. Because um, without that, they don't, they don't understand the context. They, they don't know what that information means to them. Mm. And if students don't have that kind of context or purpose, they will disengage really quickly. And then it's really hard to get them back. So Absolutely. I think a lot of university programs are kind of stuck at that point where um, there's a level of disengagement with what, what, what they're doing, not because they're bad people or bad educators, but maybe because, you know, universities move slowly. Maybe their program um, do. doesn't have the flexibility that, that we do or the, the leadership that is brave enough to, to give the staff, you know, the stuff that, that Donna has let me explore, I don't even know if that would get approved at other universities. And not, not because there's anything wrong or dodgy with what I'm doing, mm. but some What's of it's actually example? quite, um, okay. So I, um, for one of our advanced songwriting courses at the Gold Coast, I started a, um, uh, there's a, a thing called the Immersion Composition Society, which was started by two American guys um, in New York. And they were essentially having beers, they're musicians, they're playing in bands, and they were frustrated with not finding the time to write songs. You know, even though they're in bands, they're working jobs to pay to be in the bands and they're writing songs. So they started this thing. It started as a, as a dare to say, well, let's see who can write the most songs in a day. And then that became formalized down the track and called the Immersion Composition Society. 
And immersion um, composition is basically um, depending on which chapter you're a part of around the world. So I, I started the Australian chapter, not because again, on the be all and end all, it's just, there wasn't one in Australia. So mm -hmm. I, I started it. And some of my friends were already doing this anyway. Some of my peers were already doing this by themselves. Uh, but the, the one I used to run at the Gold Coast, I said to Donna, I want to run an immersion composition as part of my third year advanced songwriting. So their, their final assessment is they have to do, they have to write 20 songs in a day, fully demoed. Oh, which is crazy. Like if you, if you say that, that to someone, yeah, if you say that to someone and go, I'm going to get an undergrad to write 20 songs in a day and, and they all need to be demoed, you know, not, not fully produced like court commercial level, but demoed, you know, like yes. might be like a, a drum loop and a guitar and a vocal, you know, so we can all listen back later. Um, and she was like, sounds great. This just, you know, find a way to, idea. to make it work. And so I found a way to make it work and, um, met all the learning out, well, more than met the learning outcomes. And, um, so there's, I, you know, there's a, a bunch of students from the Gold Coast, um, who have completed this immersion day, which is a rite of passage for songwriters. So most songwriters, um, don't do immersion composition cause it's terrifying. Um, and to be honest, I generally. Um, like for, for the, for those students to do that day, there was about two weeks of prep before just that day, which included, you know, how you're sleeping, how you're eating, exercising, yeah. because it's so mentally and emotionally taxing that day, um, that you can't just go in and, you know, with no planning or preparation, you actually have to prepare like it's an extreme sport. Um, but every student that did that completed it. I only had one student ever write 19 instead of 20 songs. And that didn't mean they failed. There's nothing to do with that. No. They, they they did great. The target's twenty, but I mean, if you if you even write twelve songs in a day, that's amazing. Gosh, I'd be ha I'd be lucky to write one. Yeah. So, and <laughs> oh obviously, you know, to build up to that, we have to do these little speed writing and and kind of um you know chunk writing sessions to get them skilled up and moving towards that. Um, so some of those people now, I'm like I'm still getting emails from them because they write music for a living. That's what they do. Hmm. Um, but that's a direct result of learning some of those core skills in a really advanced way, which, you know, I, I don't think there's, I, I can't see many programs getting super excited about that from an administrative point of view or, you know, uh, yeah, I can point imagine. Of view. Yes, you want to do what, exactly. you know, exactly. so I've just done tons of things like that, but had Donna's blessing always always with um, a pedagogical framework in mind and making sure that, mm. you know, we're meeting the learning and teaching outcomes, the program level outcomes, the graduate outcomes for the university. But that's what I'm saying. Like you can still meet all those things and be really creative and inspiring with how you put together content and delivery and assessment for your students. Um, you know, like most of the ideas that I've come up with, to be honest, when I pitch them to people, you know, I, on the surface, it might appear like I just have all these ideas and they're just spontaneous. Maybe the initial kernel of the idea was spontaneous, but then I spend months in my, in my own head working through scenarios and how things will function and work. And then I pitch the idea. Um, so I'm, I, I like being an ideas person that actually gets it done. So I'm not one of those people that has an idea and then just get someone excited and then leaves. Like I can't, I have to, you know, if I, if I verbalize something, I do it. Um, so the, the coolest thing with having, um, support from, you know, my, the senior team and the executive team is there's, um, the more experienced you get at trying brave things and making them, making sure they meet all the requirements for everyone involved, the more efficient that process actually becomes and the less scary it becomes. It's almost mm. like taking calculated risks becomes part of the pedagogical practice. Well, that's what keeps it evolving. You have yeah, to, you, you have to, you have to evolve as music markets evolve, as, as the industry evolves. And we yeah. have to keep evolving as well as teachers, as institutions. Otherwise we're not going to serve not only exactly. the, the needs of the, the students, but the needs of music markets and what the population wants to listen to. Yes, and that is agreed. my my whole argument with these institutions that that are hell bent on staying stuck in a, in a model that's not serving anybody but themselves, you know, and yeah. essentially are going to put people out of work 
because they're going to be outdated. And what I love about our program, there's a couple of things that I think that are really important is that we're creating artists and not just yeah. singers and not just yeah. guitarists, you know, so they're not just vocalists and instrumentalists. By the time they leave there after third year, they are then artists. They can perform on stage and they're brilliant performers, their stage craft, everything. All those yeah. skills have all been worked on. And also too, I love our teaching cohort. I feel, I shouldn't say, but I, I love being in the program I'm in because I love the people I work with. And one of those things, we are all passionate, but it's because we've all been it at the roots of the music. We've played the music. We love the music. We immerse yeah. ourselves in that music. We get excited by that music yes. and, and we have that passion but also that performance background that we can then guide our students in a way that's very different. It's like an accountant that's never been in private practice. Yeah. 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 You know, we're, we're people that have walked the walk and talk the talk. We've yeah. been in the gutter. We've been at, at the, at the bottom, you know, we come Absolutely. through the Absolutely. school of hard knocks. So we know we've been through everything those kids are going to be through, go through as, as part of their journey. And I think that's really important. And the other thing that I love, sorry, I'm just calling no, these out because I know this is important too for our listeners is that when students come and audition that some of them have never had any formal training. I know in that first year, I'll have a singer walk in and, you know, ask them all the questions, you know, so what kind of training have you had? None. Yeah. You've never had a singing lesson? No, no singing yeah. lesson. And can I tell you, they're the ones I get most excited about. Yeah. Because the ones that have been overtrained a lot of the time, you've got to undo some of that training but also yeah. too they're way too formal for the kind of music it's not organic enough they're not yeah. organic uh, and also too it's not it's so it's not about their technical skills but to me it seems well there's something about this person that's marketable, they're employable, they're going to be a team player, they're going to bring something valuable to the course. Is that how you look at it when you're auditioning somebody? Oh, absolutely. We, we, um, I mean, they, cause it's basically the cons of school of excellence. So obviously they have to be, they have to be more than competent on their oh, yes. main instrument, but yes, you know, that, like as an example, you know, out of that 230, there would have been what a hundred and maybe 150 vocalists, you know, mm. so, and we're taking, what do we end up taking Um, five, I think mm. five vocalists out of 150. So, you know, if you're just looking for great singers, there's plenty of great singers in that 150. But if you're looking for a great singer, who's um, maybe engaged with some songwriting, even if they haven't been a primary songwriter, they've, they've been collaborating, they've got some live experience, or even if they, they you know they um have been proactively busking and and getting out there and doing some of the grind you know even at 16 17 or 15 um and they've got this kind of holistic view about they're already hungry um to learn and they're proactive that that counts mm -hmm. for a lot because you know as you said before the industry is it's tough it's not an easy industry so um there's almost, there's almost a, a duty of care in terms of the students that we let in. Sometimes we have people that are mind blowing as a performer. So they might be just a particularly great singer and they're singing in front of you, but they're deer in the headlights to the point where you're, where, you know, it's, it's, it's more like, <laughs> look, you're an amazing singer, but I think you need a year of just going and doing some gigs, putting yourself out in public, seeing some stuff, writing a couple of songs, just putting them up on streaming, just, actually doing some things and getting used to the idea of putting yourself out there just a bit because 
yes, you're a great singer, but I think you'd really well potentially drown a bit when you come into the program because you're yeah. not ready in almost any mm-hmm. other area. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a duty of care in terms of making sure students are at a great, a, a really useful place for them to come into university, uh, that they'll survive the university workload, which is a big one, but also that they can contribute across more than just one area where, wherever possible. Um, we do have, there's always some exceptions where you get a, a performer, you know, that's, you know, that, like drummers are good examples. Not all drummers can play a bunch of other instruments, um, but we had some drummers in the last audition group that were absolutely mind blowing as just drummers, like just, I'm a drummer, drummer, that's what I do. And drums is one of those things like vocals. It takes a lot of very dedicated, specific energy just on that instrument. You know, guitarists, yes, you can do, you know, you've got to do the same thing. Same thing could be argued, but they are more likely to be able to jump onto a bass a bit quicker. Lots of guitarists have had to dabble on keyboard. They can play a basic chord progression, you know. Uh, And same with some of the keyboard players can play a basic, you know, guitar progression. But yeah, we had some drummers come in there. You know, we offered them places because they were just so outstanding on their instrument. um, That's that's what they needed. But in other situations where we've got a whole bunch of different people auditioning for the one or two or three spots, it really becomes a holistic view. Like, okay, these, you know, these 25 or 30 singers are all basically sitting at a similar level. How do we get those down to five people who are going to offer a place? And that's where you start including things like their songwriting there. Have they worked with any technology? Have they gigged much? What's their experience with collaboration? What's their academic um, history like? Not because it's a prerequisite, but it mm. kind of demonstrates a certain work ethic or... Yeah, their discipline. You know, and, yeah, and ability to, to survive academic requirements, you know, which is part of uni. So, um, yeah, we, we are looking far more at the whole person than just the the single attribute, like, oh, you're a singer, so that's all we're paying attention to. Yes, it's more not just about beauty of tone and no. you can read dots on paper. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, like you said before, you know, with the vocalists, lots of them have an adolescence. Um, the majority of pop kids coming in have no theory knowledge. Mm. So, which has, um, I mean, it's kind of mostly been the case, but I think that's actually gotten worse over recent years. Um, not because theory, again, is the be all and end all of being able to do something great that's musical. Um, but I think a lot of kids are being disengaged from doing music at school because it's become more prescriptive. So they're not learning yes. those skills because yes. they're not doing music, but yes. they're passionate about music. Yes. Um, and I bet you those kids have got great ears. Most of them do, yeah, because they have to. Because that's that's the thing in our industry, you have to have excellent oral skills. Yes. You know, more so than reading music, you have to have those ears turned on all the time, listening for nuance and everything else and how can I make this different. And, yeah, I know for me that my ears are my best friend when it comes to to teaching but also in performance now you're in a leadership role you're an extremely busy person you're (laughs) teaching and you're still really passionate about teaching and i know like for me you're the person i go to whenever i feel oh my gosh i need to talk to somebody here or there might be a student that i'm a bit concerned about and then all the students come to you essentially they call us mum and dad, you know, like we're the pop mum and dads for the kids in in our program. But how do you survive that? What do you do for self-care? And and do you have to check in on yourself from time to time? Uh, From time to time, I, I, I think there's a couple of things at play with the way I approach it. Um, when when I was a kid, my dad was um, one of the uh, engineers on the New Zealand natural gas pipeline. Um, so we lived in the North Island. We started at the bottom of the North Island and the pipeline went all the way up the top. So semi-regularly, you know, as I'd finished a certain stage of the pipeline, we'd move to the next town, and which means I'd go to a new school. So as stressful as that was having to start new schools a lot, like I went to a lot of different schools, you know, mm. by the age of 10, um, it also meant that I developed very rapidly um, the skills of how to engage with a whole diverse set of people, but also how to moderate um, the depth of, um, you know, sympathy versus um, empathy, which is 
you know, to oh, yes. for, for people that haven't dug into that, that's definitely worth exploring. But, you know, um, it's important to for people to be heard, but it doesn't mean you have to take everything on. If exactly. I took on everything exactly. that, every, yeah, if, if every student that came to see me, which a lot of them do. They um, do. You know, and if, if I took on everything, you know, literally or explicitly that they emotionally dump in the, in the office sometimes, um, I'd be a, you know, a sobbing mess in the, in the corner. Mm. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's not actually useful. Um, as a leader, it's not actually useful. Um, letting them know they're heard. Um, and that, inc that includes staff, you know, any, any staff that are working for me or alongside me. Um, for me, the number one priority is that people feel heard and acknowledged. And with that comes a, an amazing sense of self-worth. Um, so you, didn't, you don't even have to say to someone, you should have self-worth. You just listen to them. And yes. if they feel heard, yes. that comes yes. with a sense of self-worth, right? Yes. So therefore, most of my job is not taking on board what they say. It's actually the opposite. It's about, I'm going to give you some time to tell me what's going on. And then I'm going to have a little quick think about it in my brain. And I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm just going to give you some thoughts and I want you to go away and I'm going to see you next week, you know, in the hallway, we're not going to do another meeting necessarily because you know, I don't have all that much free time. But um, when I see you in the hallway, I'm going to ask you, cause I remember, um, or, you know, if I haven't asked you, just come up, tap me on the shoulder and go, Hey, just want to let you know, blah, blah, blah. I want you to keep me in the loop with whether any of those ideas worked or if it, if any of the ideas did work, which one was it? Because that will then help me understand, what you need moving forward. So if, rather than it being, um, you know, uh, okay, there's all this time packed in and I'm, I'm time poor and I've got to take on all this stuff. I don't actually see it like that at all. I just see it as, okay, there's a little bit of time here. We can talk about this stuff. I want you to feel heard. I want you to feel acknowledged. I want you to feel valued. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to, you know, continue to encourage any behavior that's contributing to you feeling that way. I'm not going to give you easy answers because that's what you came in for. Cause that's not my job. You can go to your friends for that. Yeah. So I always, always keep, um, which I think is why the students come to me, to be honest, is um, they get the truth. Uh, I'm never rude. I'm never prescriptive. Um, like I said, my whole career, my whole life has been about being able to adjust in the moment and not being afraid of that. So therefore my most stable state is being adaptive. The minute mm -hmm. I feel like I'm being prescriptive, it's really uncomfortable because it's not yes. actually very, yes. it's not useful. In most situations, it's not useful. Mm -hmm. And you'll end up in a position where you either suggest something that's what you do, not what's actually good for the person, um, or you end up in a position where they reject what you said and you feel defensive. And either one of those positions is not helpful for you or for the other person. No one's so, winning. No. So that, that idea of being adaptable and flexible in the moment and backing yourself to lean on your experience and your skill set to have something for them. And if you don't say, I don't have anything for you. I'm really sorry. I, I hear you. I acknowledge you. I don't actually have a solution mm. for you. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll run this over in my mind. And if I think of something, I'll let you know, but you know what, maybe you could go and talk to this person. I know that they recently, you know, had to go through you know this particular thing you know as good teachers too irrespective of being in your leadership role but as teachers we need to refer out when we don't know something anyway if someone Absolutely. comes to us not so much i mean we have to teach who's in front of us but in in our jobs within that institution but in private studio or in situations where you can refer out if you don't know something or if it's a style you don't have empathy for if it's a piece of knowledge that they're wanting from you that you don't understand you do need to do that you can't take on everything you have to know what your boundaries are you and you have to know your limitations also yeah. And the limitations don't make you less of a teacher or make you weak. Every single person on the planet has limitations. Hmm. And those limitations are either because you've prioritized other things. So therefore let someone else cover those limitations. Who's happened to prioritize that particular thing. Uh, or if you, if you want to, you might go, Oh, that's actually a limitation that the students revealed to me or this person I'm going to spend the next couple of months filling in that gap in my knowledge. Cause I'm hungry to learn. And either one's 
fine, but you don't have to. If it's, if that's not something that's a burning passion and you've got mm. time to spend on other stuff, mm. delegate. Get someone else who's exactly. more of an expert than you. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, we, I developed, yeah. I was just going to say, I developed this, this cool technique, um, partly because of my dad, um, I think, but also um, there's a couple of people in my life early on. I had this maths teacher at school. I hated maths, but he was a genius. <laughs> um, no, he was, he was incredible, but maths sucked. I just didn't, now no. I can do maths fine, but I didn't, I didn't enjoy oh, those I courses. Still can't. <laughs> yeah, um, but he, he would do this thing where students might pose a tricky question because we had some really incredibly smart kids in our, in our particular class this year and um, some of them, you know, were like maths awards winners for, you know, national competitions and stuff. So, um, and they'd ask some questions and one thing I, I remember him doing and my dad does this too and I, I, I'm i assuming I've taken it on because I've seen it or maybe it's hardwired into me but if someone says something or that triggers a thought in my head or asks me a question that I don't know, I don't respond straight away. Hmm. Um, because um, either um, you tend to respond from a place where you feel you should know, so you're a bit embarrassed or awkward, so you just kind of bumble through it, which is human nature. It's not, it doesn't make anyone bad for doing it. It's just human nature. Um, or the other thing is that you, um, you tend to dismiss too quickly the fact that you don't know anything, but that might not be true either. So, because I remember that um, uh, Mr. Martin was his name <laughs> and student might ask something and he'd pause for a tick and it'd be, you know, maybe 10 seconds, but that feels like two minutes, you know, when you're in a class and there's silence. Absolutely. And you could see him, the, the wheels spinning, and then he'd respond in a really measured way. And, and it was always, okay, I don't know this part of it, but you know what? You've made me think that the first part of your question actually has something to do with this. So we could explore that. But the second part I actually haven't encountered yet. So that might be something for you to do next over the week and then next week come in and let us all know, you know, so it's that kind of response. Yes. So yes. I, that's how I, um, you know, I have days where I'm, I'm not as effective at it as, as other days, but for the most part, I've, mm. I've ingrained that as a habitual response. If something, if someone suggests something that's different to what my plan was, or if a student um, brings up something that's a tangent that, um, might not align exactly with what my content delivery is for that class, but is incredibly valuable. And that they happen to be particularly passionate about it as a group that day, rather than just dismiss it and say, let's go, we'll get to that next week. I just give myself a pause, take 10 seconds. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I can actually move some of this content to next week. This is more important in the moment right now. They're going to learn a lot. This is going to improve engagement. Okay. But I might say to them, okay, look, um, <clears throat> We've got five minutes. I can't go more than that. We've got five minutes to explore that. If it goes any deeper, I'm happy to stay around outside of class or I can actually make some room over the next few weeks for it. But you know what I mean? That 10 seconds yes. of yes. Just taking a moment yeah. is actually... I do that. Um, mm. It demonstrates to your students in real time that you're being as adaptable as you tell them they should be. Mm. Exactly. Um, yeah. If a student brings something in and they want my opinion on it, Mm. or I need to give an opinion or advice and I'm not sure, I often sit there and I take a, and they're used to it, that I take a big breath. This is usually how it goes. It's like, hmm. And it's dead silence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that to someone the other day via Zoom we were having a conversation about structuring a presentation and I went deadly quiet and mm -hmm. I did the whole, hmm. Yep. And he said, are you all right? Are you okay with this? Like, is everything fine? I said, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think he's ever encountered anyone that thinks about anything before, before giving an answer. <laughs> But I wasn't going to yeah. respond for the sake of making noise. Like no. I wanted to make sure that when I responded, I was going to offer something valuable and not something that was just contrived in that, in that spontaneous dead silent moment. But anyway, yeah. we're going to, we're going to wrap this up because we've been talking for a long time. <laughs> yes. We, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we been, may have to easy. split this. It's a, yeah. It's I an know. easy chat. So. It is, it is. And you're such a great conversationalist and you have so much to offer. And we may need to split this up into two episodes, I feel.
But when it comes to your legacy, you've done so much. What do you think your legacy will be? I, or what would you like it to be? Yeah, I think because you can't control that necessarily. But I, I was actually talking to my wife about this only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and cause we're having a chat, we often, when we have our, you know, we have a hot drink after our days to debrief and maybe a cookie or something. <clears throat> and we talk about our days and go through stuff, but we're talking for whatever reason, we're talking about legacy. Um, uh, she, she's lost both her parents over recent mm. years and, um, her mum in particular has left a mark, a really positive mark on me. She was an amazing lady. And I, I was saying, you know, for me, when I was younger, I thought my, I wanted my legacy to be about the art, you know, about the things I'd created. Um, but honestly, the, the truth is I just want, I want to, my legacy to be that I contributed in some way, um, mm. mm -hmm. to enriching as many people's lives as possible. So, mm -hmm. and being a teacher is one of those rare positions where I have a fresh batch of people coming through every single year. And if I'm doing my job right, they leave stronger and more informed and more educated and more empowered than they did when they came in. And yes. additionally, if I'm doing my job well, most of that feels like their own discovery and most of it is their ownership over their own journeys. And that that idea that there's hundreds, well, probably thousands now of, um, of students out there in the world and at least a chunk of those, I'd like to think that I've had uh, an impact in some way on in their lives being better or, or particularly them being more holistically developed as people. That's what I want my legacy to be. Um, there's no way of quantifying that because, you know, when, after you've gone, I don't know what my legacy is going to be. No, no. Um, but the idea of, of, for me, it's all about people. So yes, yes. I've got plenty of music out there and, and my, my kids love, they can listen to dad years after I have passed on, they still be able to listen to me sing songs to them and stuff on recording. So that's beautiful and that's a privilege. But honestly, the impact on people, including my wife and my kids, that's that's what I want my legacy to be. You you and I are kindred spirits in so many ways. We often mm. end up back at the circling around and always end up at the same place <laughs> when we have discussions. I I'm one hundred percent like you. It's about yep. empowering others. For me, it's a, it's about helping my students discover their authentic voice, yeah. not not just as singers, but to find their voice in life through singing, if possible, yep. through their yep. through their craft, and and empowering others to believe that anything is possible. You can do yep. anything you put your mind to. You really yep. can. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, so important. So one last question. Sure. If you had to give a piece of advice, I was going to say to emerging artists, I'm not going to give ask that question because there's going to probably be a lot of teachers listening to this or people who are educators or in leadership roles. But if you mm. had to give one piece of advice to our teaching community, what would that be? one piece um and I mean, you're allowed to a, pause and breathe yeah there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a few things that pop to mind but i think um i'll go with this one um and i'll try and be as articulate as i as i can um one of the things that struck me talking to peers and and you know uh, people from the the teaching and education community is particularly in academia, but this, this is true for secondary school as well. Um, I think my advice would be that um, you aren't what your, your academic identity is or that your teaching identity is. You aren't just that. And part two would be that your identity can be changed. You can change any of that at any point. Because um, the idea is that I, I've talked to so many academics and, and pedagogues where because of the way it's structured, they, they invest in a certain trajectory and they go down that trajectory and then they become that person. Oh, this is the person that does this particular thing. And the advice is, you know, for early researchers, that's what you should do because it's a way of building a name for yourself. But it's also a recipe for getting lost and narrowing who you are and, and your impact, mm. potential impact on the broader world and 
the opportunities to grow from all these other things and narrowing it down to this particular pursuit. And yes. um, a lot of the people I've talked to, it actually becomes a point of sadness and disillusionment for them. So yeah, my advice would be, there's nothing wrong with, with investing energy and time into pursuing a particular trajectory in your life. And, and there's chapters we all go through where you have to do that. You know, you have to skill up. You've got to understand how this thing works. You need to dedicate three years or five years or whatever to it. But if that's at the expense of growing in other areas of your life, then that's dangerous to me. And we are far, um, far deeper and wider and bigger and more expansive as human beings than just the thing that people want to put on us as a, as a label. So yes. whether it's a vocal teacher that's listening or, a, you know, um, you know, course convener or, you know, a high school teacher that's frustrated at the curriculum I've got to teach with them, that isn't all you are. You aren't that thing. Stay hungry to learn about other stuff, even things that have mm. nothing to do with your teaching. Stay passionate about Absolutely. learning about those things. And then they happen to come back. They always come back and infect your teaching in a good way anyway. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, people tried to label me early on as the songwriting guy. And I'm like, you can label me that if you want. That's not me. I, I happen to know a lot about songwriting, but that's not me. I do a yeah. lot of things. I'm not going to yeah. be just the songwriting Same. guy. You can call me what you want. Yeah. Yeah. But that's actually diminishing my potential to really see myself as this more holistic person that's that's wants to explore as much of the world as possible, you know? Um, so, yeah, people can call you what they want. They can pigeonhole you academically or pedagogically how they want to. The trick is don't buy into that yourself. Be okay with being, you know, investing energy into that community. That's great. But don't switch off the other parts of your learning from the rest of uh, what's around you. It's incredibly enriching and it's a way of staying passionate through decades of your life i'm, I'm exactly. probably more passionate now than i was in my 20s because that's been the way i've approached my life i'd have to agree with my teaching yeah i feel like that and i think it's because i have invested in other areas but it's all fed back in some weird way if you're working on yourself even if you're if you're uh, investing in learning about yourself, you are a far better person as a teacher. You know, well, it's, you it's have to... what you just said, you know, what you just said before about, you know, your vocal students, you're not just teaching them to be singers, you're teaching them about who are you? What's your authentic voice? What's got to come from them as a person and they're coming up through yeah. their voice. We aren't, we can't say that to our students and then not do that as teachers. No, so we need exactly. to keep enriching who we are as a person. Exactly. Um, and not get too lost in just the activity of teaching or being defined as a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just one part of who we are. Exactly. So anyway, that's and probably that's, a bit long-winded, but yeah. anyway. No, no, no. Uh, but one, one comment to that, and that's pedagogy too. Yes. Because people only take one part of what pedagogy really is. They forget yeah. about it's the art and science of teaching. It's more than just process. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Caleb, we're going to finish up, and I'm going to share your links with everybody. So if they want to listen to some of your music, you have some amazing music that you share on your website. People want to learn more about this brilliant program that we have the privilege of working in. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being an amazing boss. You're just <laughs> the you best. Go. You really are. And no, you're, the, you're my go-to person. You're like my my voice of reason at times. It's like, oh, I always feel so much better after I've seen Caleb. I wish I go. had That's... his demeanor. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can get, I, I'm a little bit passionate about <laughs> at times. Yep. And that can overshadow things but that's okay it all comes from yep. a good place but it thank does. you so much thank you for your time and i'll see you next year absolutely we'll do it all over again it's gonna be great yeah. take care thank all you right. Kayla. bye yeah.